a new Super Bowl champion. We got a new Super Bowl champion. Actually, we don't. It's the same dude yet again. The Stephen A. Smith Show in the house. Let's go. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the latest edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show coming at you, as I love to do at the very least three times a week over the digital airwaves of YouTube. Um, as always, I'm really appreciative and thankful for the subscribers that I have. We have now exceeded 555,000 subscribers, picking up over about 7,000 subscribers over the weekend. Appreciate the love. Keep it coming, and I'm going to keep on coming. As always, to continue to support the show, just simply like and follow the show, clicking on the bell, and boom, there you have it. You'll be Yet our latest subscriber. And while you're doing so, also make sure to pick up a co copy of my new book, uh, Straight Shooter, a memoir of second chances and first takes, which is now in paperback, by the way. Uh, so you can go to straightshooterbook.com and order the book, and I'd appreciate it. And uh, it'll show your love and support for me like you've been giving me. So again, thank you. Thank you so much. Let's get right to it because i got a lot to get into before I have my man Lewis Riddick, NFL analyst extraordinaire, coming on to break down what transpired uh, last night at Super Bowl 58 in Las Vegas, Nevada, Nevada at Allegiant Stadium, uh, where the Kansas City Chiefs ended up winning their second consecutive Super Bowl courtesy of a 25-22 victory over the San Francisco 49ers. Now, we can sit up there and bloviate about all of this other stuff. We can talk about the greatness of Patrick Mahomes. Um, people can sit up there and be tired of it. They could be, you know, annoyed with it because obviously he's the giant right now and everybody wants to knock him off his pedestal. But the reality is you can't do it. Right now what we have to talk about is where Pat, you know, where, where this guy Pat Mahomes is. There's no way around it. He's the best in the game. He's the best in the world. He's the best in the modern era. Um, there have been plenty of times I've wanted to sit up there and say Aaron Rodgers because he is a bad man. But even before his injury-riddled season last year, in which he only played a, a, a series, for crying out loud, before getting hurt on a fourth play of that Monday night game at MetLife Stadium, there had been plenty of opportunities for Aaron Rodgers to win a Super Bowl since 2010. He hasn't been able to get it done. Hasn't been able to get it done in the NFC Championship games. Haven't been able to get it done on his home turf in, at Lombardi, at Lambeau Field, rather. Um, and we've seen it. We've seen him lose a playoff game uh, to the San Francisco 49ers where he scored just 10 points. We saw him lose a season finale with a playoff on the line to the Detroit Lions before they made the ascension this season. We haven't seen such things from Patrick Mahomes. When we sit up there and we talk about Patrick Mahomes, let's cut through the mustard. He's been a starting quarterback in the National Football League for six years. All six years he's been to the AFC Championship game. Three times he's been, four times, I'm sorry, he's been to the Super Bowl. Three times he's won a Super Bowl championship and was the Super Bowl MVP. And the one time that he wasn't, the one time that he lost, it was to Tom Brady. And oh, by the way, courtesy of having to run for his life because he had no offensive line to protect him against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. In Tampa, by the way, for that Super Bowl. That's what we remember about Patrick Mahomes. But right now I'd ask you to look at this. Super Bowl 58, clear path to victory to Super Bowl 58. Wild card game. Arrowhead Stadium, Kansas City, Missouri. The Miami Dolphins comes in there in freezing temperatures. And what does the Kansas City Chiefs do? They defeat the NFL's number one offense in total offense and number two in scoring offense. The very next week in the divisional playoff game against the Buffalo Bills, when they beat Buffalo 27-24 to on the road in Buffalo at Orchard Park when everybody was questioning whether or not they were going to be able to get it done. What does he do? He wins 27-24. It's the third time. He's beating Josh Allen and the Bills in the playoffs. They're 3-0 against the Bills. He goes to the AFC Championship game, clearly the Baltimore Ravens, who smacked around Detroit during the regular season, smacked around Seattle during the regular season, bum-rushed and beat down San Francisco on the road during the regular season. That same Baltimore Ravens squad, Kansas City, went on the road in Baltimore against the soon-to-be two-time league MVP in Lamar Jackson. And what does the Kansas City Chiefs do? They hold Lamar Jackson and the Baltimore Ravens offense to 10 points. They win the game 17-10, defeating the AFC's number one overall seed. And then they win in Super Bowl 58 last night. I'm looking at Patrick Mahomes and I'm saying to myself, my God, what else can he do? 
Do y'all know that in four Super Bowl appearances for Patrick Mahomes, he's been down 10 points each game? Did you know that? Did you know he was down by 10 points in San Francisco? Did you know? You know he didn't come back against Tampa Bay. Did you know that he was down 24 to 14 against the Philadelphia Eagles last year? And did you know that he was down 10 points yesterday? But look what happened. Three out of four occasions, they end up victorious. Comparisons after halftime, Patrick Mahomes, knowing that they were struggling, knowing that they couldn't get anything going, complete 69.7% of his passes after halftime, 210 yards passing, two touchdowns, just an interception, 59 rushing yards in the second half and overtime. Patrick Mahomes is that dude. The Kansas City Chiefs receivers led the league and dropped passes. What does Patrick Mahomes do? He gets them to a Super Bowl championship anyway. Last year, they went to the Super Bowl without, without Tyreek Hill, the cheater, who we know was a league MVP candidate in Miami this year because he's so electrifying. And without him, they won the Super Bowl. I know you got your bag, Tyreek Hill. I know you got your bag. You got your money. And you deserve every single freaking penny of those dollars. But I ask you something, Tyreek Hill, with all due respect. You sure you... You, 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 you're happy with your decision? Now, let's clarify. I ask that question strictly for football reasons. I know it's a hell of a lot better in South Beach than it is in Kansas City. I get that. No argument there. No state income taxes in Florida either. I get that too. Warmer weather. I get that too. But I still say to you, for football reasons, playing with a quarterback, you sure you're good with your decision to leave Patrick Mahomes? Matter of fact, we have to now start drawing a comparison. I would dare say, ladies and gentlemen, this warrants a comparison between Tyreek Hill and Kevin Durant. Which one is worse? Tyreek Hill leaving Patrick Mahomes or Kevin Durant leaving Steph Curry? Because y'all saw that game when the shot he hit. Saturday night against Kevin Durant and the Phoenix Suns, right? Which one is worse? Which decision is worse? Tyreek Hill leaving Patrick Mahomes to join Tua Tungvaloa or Kevin Durant leaving Steph Curry to join Kyrie Irving? Which one is worse? Y'all debate it. I ain't going to even give you my answer right now. I'm going to hold on for a couple of days. I'm going to save that subject for another day. But it's a worthy question to ask, and don't tell me it ain't. Because when you see what Patrick Mahomes is doing, it's something special to behold. And we just got to call it like we see it and just be honest about it. Because there's really no way around this. By the way, before I move on to my next subject, Patrick Mahomes, 3-1 and one record in the Super Bowl. 65 completion percentage, 267 yards passing, 7 touchdowns, 5 interceptions. Not an updated passer rating as of yet, but he's a 3-time Super Bowl MVP. Ladies and gentlemen, he may be the best of all time. Whether or not it's the greatest, I got to look at Tom Brady's resume. And I got to say, oh, my goodness, I can't give him that. But you want me to tell you who else I can't give it to him over in terms of Super Bowls? I can't give it to him over Joe Montana. The game was rougher. It was far more physical. You couldn't get penalized for passing gas at that particular moment in time. You had a lot of that going on. Joe Montana, the game was far more physical. There was a mugging that took place on a football field every second. And Joe Montana was still 4-0, 68% completions, 285 and a half passing yards, 11 touchdowns, not one single interception, zero. And oh, by the way, a passer rating of 127.8. He's also a three-time Super Bowl MVP. And if you want me to give Patrick Mahomes the GOAT status in official capacity, I'll tell you I don't need him to three-peat, but I need one more. You know why I need one more? Because Brady went 10 years without winning a championship after he won his third. He didn't win his fourth for 10 years, from 2004 to 2014. I don't need Patrick Mahomes to disappear for the next 10 years. So I just wanted to throw that out. Let me move on to this next subject real quick. Because now that we've expanded beyond Patrick Mahomes' greatness, we got to wonder about the Chiefs. And at some point in time, we got to ask the question, is there anybody that can conceivably really, really derail the Kansas City Chiefs? You win a Super Bowl despite receivers dropping passes. I mean, Marcus Valdez-Scantlin actually caught a pass and ran backwards yesterday. 
What an idiotic thing to do. But what did Patrick Mahomes do? After Chris Jones jumped off the bench and was just like screaming, what are you doing? After Patrick Mahomes put his head to his helmet, like, what are you doing? The very next play, Patrick Mahomes went right back to Marquez Valdez-Scantling. And this is also an individual that scored a touchdown yesterday, caught a touchdown pass yesterday. McCole Harmon, who was exiled to the New York Jets before being brought back during this season, he caught the game-winning touchdown. But Valdez Scantlin did catch a touchdown pass. Give credit where credit is due. But give major credit to Patrick Mahomes going right back to him a little bit later on or late, later on in the game. But I would say to you, when I look at that and I look at the Kansas City Chiefs, I can't, even though I picked them to win, it would have been nice if San Francisco had won because we would have seen somebody derail and knock off the Kansas City Chiefs and Patrick Mahomes. But now that that didn't happen, how can you foreshadow somebody knocking them off in the future? I don't know. I, don't, I can't see it. I'm wondering about that. And I think that needs to be said. I look, I've got to ask Lewis Riddick about this later on in the show. Who can do it? Is it Josh Allen? Is it Lamar Jackson? Is it Joe Burrow who will be returning from injury? We've seen Cleveland's defense. What about Deshaun Watson and the Cleveland Browns? Could they do it? What about Jim Harbaugh now that he's in Los Angeles for the Chargers? Can he get Justin Herbert to elevate his level of play so they could deal with that stuff? It's going to be real interesting to see Andy Reid versus Jim Harbaugh in a regular season twice a year now. Justin Herbert going up against Patrick Mahomes. Now that he's got a real coach that's going to be behind him. We're going to, it's going to be real interesting to see what's going to happen there. I'm just wondering who's going to be the chief killer. I don't know if anybody definitively can be that person. <laughs> I really, really don't. But it would be interesting to talk to Lewis Riddick about that and find out what his, where his thoughts are. And so I think about it from that perspective, and I'll leave it at that. The other thing that I wanted to get into before we go to break or go to Lewis Riddick, to be quite honest with you, was Brock Purdy. Mr. Irrelevant, last guy drafted, comes out this year, plays his ass off. For the most part, got to give credit where credit is due. Didn't look flummoxed or unpoised or anything like that in the first half. Held his own. Didn't think he played a bad game at all. I'm looking at numbers here. Completed 12 of his 19 attempts against the Blitz. That's 63% for 131 yards and a touchdown while getting sacked just once. The Chiefs defense blitzed on 51% of his dropbacks. Their fourth highest rate in the game under defensive coordinator Steve Spagnola. I thought if the 49ers had won Christian McCaffrey, C Mac would have been the league and would, would have been the game's Super Bowl MVP. Led the Niners in catches with eight and receiving yards in 80 and becoming the first player in Super Bowl history with 80 yards receiving and 80 yards rushing in a game. Christian McCaffrey was balling. He fumbled early in the game. I get that part. That was a mistake. That was a faux pas. But nevertheless, he showed up. When I think about Debo Samuel and Brandon Ayuk, I say, where were they? I don't blame them because I saw times and gaps where they could have been open, but Purdy went six for 17. 35% for 82 yards and no touchdowns when targeting Samuel or Ayuk. I wonder how much of that was about them, how much of that was about him. Purdy, he only connected with George Kittle for just two catches for four yards. How the hell did this happen? I'm not looking at Purdy. I'm looking at Kyle Shanahan. Because you doubled up. You threw the football twice as many times as you ran the football. Well, who the hell were you throwing it to? And if you got Christian McCaffrey, I know he had about 30 touches, but damn, you got to run that football. You got to feed that beast. You got to get the ball to him. Kyle Shanahan didn't do it. And as a result, now we're sitting here talking about Kyle Shanahan. Three consecutive NFC title games. All right. Two Super Bowl appearances. Four conference title appearances in the last five years and not a single Super Bowl championship to show for it. This is the same Kyle Shanahan that was the offensive coordinator in Atlanta when they lost a 28-3 lead. This is the same Kyle Shanahan that had a 10-point lead against the Kansas City Chiefs. A few years back. And it's the same Kyle Shanahan that had a 10-point lead last night. At some point in time, what are you, the Bud Grant and the Minnesota Vikings? Losing four Super Bowls? What are you, Merv, uh, you, you know, Marv Levy? Losing four Super Bowls in Buffalo? Yeah, getting there matters, and it is tough, and it's not easy. But if you get your ass kicked when you get there, or even if you don't get your ass kicked and you just lose a hard-fought, tough game, people are not going to remember you historically for working hard. You worked hard. You really, really tried. Congratulations. They're not going to do that. They're going to say, what the hell was up? You couldn't close. You couldn't get it done. And that's what we have to say about Kyle Shanahan at this particular moment in time, despite his obvious greatness as a coach. And then after the game, for the team to be sitting there talking about, they didn't know about the overtime rule. 
They forgot that the rule had been changed where both teams get to touch the football in overtime now. Not just the first team that scored a touchdown. If you get the ball first and you score a touchdown, the other team doesn't get it back. That rule was eradicated last year. And for the players to be saying we didn't know anything about it and we didn't prepare for it. For Chris Jones of the Kansas City Chiefs to highlight how we did prepare for it. We were made aware of it. Our coaching staff had ready for it. We practiced it all year long. That matters. For the San Francisco 49ers to say they didn't know the rule was embarrassing. It was a blemish on the part of Kyle Shanahan because you ain't teaching. And it was a blemish on the part of the players because clearly you ain't interested in reading about your own industry. Your football players, you're supposed to know. If it goes to overtime, we both get the ball. They didn't know. For shame. For shame. But I've said enough there because you don't need to hear my expertise on the sport of football when there's somebody so much better to qualify and qualify to communicate that to you. He is an NFL analyst extraordinaire, like I told you before. And I'll wait until he comes on board to give you the rest of the superlatives of his resume. My man, Lewis Riddick, is here. My next guest is somebody I love talking to. You know, I mean, he's an extraordinary NFL analyst, no doubt about that. Former uh, player personnel guy, former NFL player in Cleveland, along with other places. Obviously does an exceptional job, my daytime job at ESPN, uh, calling football games, analyzing football games. He's a savant, make no mistake about it. But I also call him Mr. Chippendales because usually, you know, he's <laughs> the one with the shirt the unbuttoned and stuff like that, trying to trying to look like, like, like Mr. Sexy and all of that stuff. So I thought that's why I thought I'd rock this look today yeah, just yeah. for him. The one and only Lewis Riddick is here with yours truly. What's going on, Big Tom? How are you, man? I'm I'm doing great. As you see, I got the turtleneck on, zipped all the way up to the top, because you know I, I ain't you. letting you I ain't letting you go ahead and making jokes about me. Today. <laughs> I got you. I got you. Listen, I remember every time I think about the subject of Patrick Mahomes, I think about mm. the guy that um I spoke to, which was you, before this guy was even drafted. He came into mm. the draft, and you was talking about how special this kid was, and how he was going to be, and you couldn't understand how so many other people weren't seeing it. I remember the Chicago Bears having the number two overall pick moving up in the draft and passing on him and Deshaun Watson, for crying out loud. We reflect on that, and, we, and yet last night we saw Super Bowl 58, Patrick Mahomes win his third Super Bowl title, his third Super Bowl MVP. Your thoughts as you reflect on this kid and, and, and what we're witnessing before our very eyes at the age of 28. I think it goes all the way back, Stephen A., to that draft when Brett Veach, the current general manager, he wasn't the general manager yet, but he had gone and scouted Patrick numerous times and went back to Andy Reid and went back to the scouting department and said, look, I'm putting all my chips in. I'm putting it all on the table. He will take us to another level that Alex Smith can't take us to. Mm. He has that stuff that you can't coach, the kind of things that in games like we just saw last night, he will just take over and make enough plays in order to win the game. And, they, and remember, Alex Smith that year when Patrick got drafted, Alex Smith had an, a Pro Bowl year. He went to the Pro Bowl, had his best year as a professional. Right. They told me that spring after they drafted him, they knew right away in the first OTA minicamp, they had to pull themselves back and say, do we need to put him in here right now? Or should we continue to wait? There were numerous times during the course of the year where they felt, felt as though they should put him in the game for Alex Smith because they thought he was ready then, but they waited. And the fact that they waited and then he came out his first year as a starter and won the MVP and just went ballistic and took the league by storm, it's been up and up and up parabolic since then. Since then. And so last night, when you see basically for two and a half quarters, man, he was struggling. Yeah. The offense was struggling, doing nothing. Right. But what wound up happening was since San Francisco wouldn't put them away, he was like, you know what, eventually I'm going to figure this out. Defense, just keep me in there and I'll figure it out. I'll make enough plays to Travis Kelsey. I'll make enough plays on fourth and one on an RPO and I'll do it myself. I'll make enough plays in overtime where I'm going to scramble when they go man coverage and I'm going to darn near score myself. And then I'm going to wind up calling a play the same way that we beat Philadelphia a year ago. I'm going to use the same play and I'm going to beat you, San Francisco. I'm going to beat you and I'm going to put the ball to a guy who we had sent away from here yeah. and then brought him back in McCole Hart. He has that thing, again, that's uncoachable. And, but then when you put it with one of the greatest coaches of all time, it kind of it's a force multiplier, Stephen A, for them both. It makes Andy a better coach. It makes Patrick a better player. Andy told me at practice last week, he said, look, the number one thing Patrick can do is he can come off the field and tell me what all 21 guys outside of himself were doing. 
Right. And that makes it easier for me. I can go ahead then and make all the adjustments in the world and say, and send him back out there and just let him go. So really what he's saying is this. He's got the mind of the greats of all time like Tom Brady, but he's got skill that is infinitely more than what they are. So as long as everything else around him stays competent, he's going to be able to raise the level of everyone else. And there's no question he will be on the chase from now until his career is over to surpass Tom Brady in terms of winning, not in terms of individual mm -hmm. accomplishment. He's already done that. But in terms of win, how does a multitude of teams miss out on somebody whose talent so far exceeds so many? Because remember, it would be one thing if Patrick Mahomes sat on a bench like Jordan Love did for three years, comes in, plays as well as Jordan Love played this year, even though he had his ups and downs, play as well as Jordan Love played this year. And somebody missed out on that. But if the Kansas City Chiefs had to restrain themselves from throwing him in immediately because the first day of OTAs, they saw what his capability of. How do you explain the fact that nine of 10 teams passed up on him and didn't spot that level of talent? How does that happen in an NFL draft? I'll, I'll tell you how. Because, you know, with the 32 teams, man, we could have 32 representatives from each team watch the same guy simultaneously. And you'll have 32 different opinions. Because it's so subjective when you're just watching the tape. And remember now, at, pa at Texas Tech, Patrick, man, there were many times where you're sitting there going, what is this guy doing? It wasn't always clean. It wasn't always pretty. I mean, there were some there were some throws where, where he made, like the throw he made to McColl last night that got called back. Or rather, no, it was the play that Tayshawn Gibson should have intercepted. Where he, okay. threw, he rolled left and threw it all the way across the field. And there were plays like that at Texas Tech. There were also plays like the interception he threw last night on the force, trying to force it to Travis Kelsey. Yeah. So there, there were people Overthrown. going, yeah, there's people going, look, he's super talented, but we don't know if we have the structure in order to pull more of the good out of him or whether or not the bad is going to serve us. Mm -hmm. So what happens is he starts to slide. But Andy trusts Brett. Brett tells him, look, in our structure, with Alex Smith here and the way you coach, we think we can eliminate more of the bad, a lot of the bad, and bring out more of the good because the fact of the matter is his upside far exceeds everyone else's. Mm. And he has it up here. So what you do is you take a calculated risk. And a lot of times, look, I, I can't tell you that if he went to 31 other teams, Stephen A., that he'd be the same guy. Okay. He can't tell you that either. Mm. What, what, what he can tell you, though, is this. I have a relationship with Andy Reid that is on the level of Belichick Brady. That's on the level of... Steve Young, Holmgren, Montana, Holmgren. It's that kind of thing. And Patrick will tell you himself. Look, I just saw a quote where he said this the other day, where I, and, I, and I've seen this before, where he said, I didn't even think I was going to play football. I thought I was going to be a baseball player. I didn't realize I'd be this good at football. Mm. And the fact that he didn't quite know, but he knew he's super talented. Brett Veach didn't know for sure whether or not they'd be able to pull it out of him, but he believed that Andy could. And then go into a place where he can sit and look. You cannot underestimate the power of having a guy like Alex Smith in your quarterback room and what he learned from him. Right. He learned how to be a pro. Because it ain't just about the flash plays, man. It's about the process. It's about, You know, you spend time with Nick. You yeah. know how Nick talked about that down at Alabama. No, no question. It isn't about the end result. It's about the work, being dedicated, married, um, sadistic with the work. And that's what Patrick had become because of him being around Alex Smith. And then being with Andy. And then being with Eric Bieniemy, who held him accountable down there. Let's not let's not discount that either. That's right. And then they get him. Then they have Travis Kelsey. They get Tyreek Hill. Mm. They get the offensive line built up. This I mean, and it's just it's just compounds. Well, let me go to Super Bowl fifty eight last night more specifically and ask you if there was a defining moment that that I mean, outside of the winning play itself that yeah. made you believe what ended up happening was inevitably going to happen. What was it? Because I got to admit, I was very, very worried in the first half yeah. when I saw, and I said to myself, what is wrong with Andy Reid? He doesn't seem to be himself. How yeah. the hell has Travis Kelsey got one target for one reception yeah. for one yard in an entire first half? He's one of the greatest tight ends in the history of football. And mm -hmm. Tom what, what the hell is going on here? I, I didn't know what was going on. What stood out in your mind? I think where... Look, when they when San Fran had been stoned in Kansas City all night, they force a punt, I believe it's in the third quarter, 
and obviously the ball touches one of the players on the punt return team. They get the ball deep in San Francisco territory. The next play, he hits MBS on that yep. little switch route. Right there, it scan. woke up the team. Yep. Because they were sleepwalking. Look, San Fran was dealing with them. Rushing the passer, slamming the run. The secondary was playing good. But after that, Patrick started going. Then he started going. And then when they drove the ball – down the field and tied the score up before it went into overtime. There was a there was a long 22-yard gain, I believe it was, to Travis Kelsey, mm-hmm. where Kelsey comes all the way across the field. They had him double team, and they still blew it. And the thing about Patrick was, when I'm sitting there watching, I was watching the tape this morning, I'm going, you know what? He wasn't perfect in this game at all. But if you give him, give him enough in terms of making mistakes, he's going to capitalize on it. He's going to find it eventually. You can't let him hang around. And then that fourth and one in overtime, people where they call timeout, they come out of there and people. And I remember we were in the booth going, "They got to run it. They're gonna give it to Pacheco. They're gonna give it to someone." But she yeah. writes out of the backfield. I said, "Man, you're crazy. They're gonna put Patrick in the gun, and they're gonna run something with him out on the edge and let him figure it out." This is a half a billion dollar quarterback, mm-hmm. and when they put him in the gun and he ran that RPO and picked up the first down, I was like, "That's it. There it is. He's gonna figure out a way to get this ball down here and score." And that's exactly what it, that was the play where on fourth down, most people were probably screaming and he's going to mess this up. He's going to try and put them in gun. They ain't going to be able to pick up the first down. And he said, you know what? I'm going to ride the guy who has changed the game at this position. And Patrick figured it out. We can't say the same for Brock Purdy, who did not play a bad game. who yeah. was far from awful. But his crime was that against Patrick Mahomes, you needed to measure up. And when it counted, Patrick Mahomes stood taller than anybody else on the football field. What do mm-hmm. we make of Brock Purdy and San Francisco's performance in the aftermath of this loss? Well, I'll tell you what. There, there's no question. Coming out in the second half, they think they went three straight three and outs. Yes. Couldn't move the ball. They weren't running it. They kept trying to throw it. Brock first down for a quarter. Right. But what, what wound up happening was he wound up getting them in a position to win the football game. Okay, where he didn't have the ball less. Now, I will say this. In that overtime drive, where they had to settle for the field goal, they had bad, bad miscommunication on the offensive line where they turned Chris Jones scot-free. Yep. Scot-free. He has two guys wide open. He has Jawan Jennings wide open. He has Brandon Ayuk wide didn't open. didn't have time to get it to him. It didn't, he couldn't get it to him. Exactly. So I'm sitting there going, and I know the boy. I know he's going to make them throws. He was making them all night. But they turn loose their best defensive player. So, therefore, they have to kick the field goal, and then they can't get off the field in overtime. They can't get off the field. So, what I sat there and I thought was this. Is this really about Brock not measuring up? Is it about breakdowns around him? There's enough blame to go around for San Francisco. I just said earlier today, they're going to be haunted by this game forever. They should have won that game. Mm-hmm. They should have won that game. And I'm not going to sit here and say Brock didn't measure up to Patrick. But I will say this, Patrick figured out a way to win it in crunch time, aided by the fact that San Francisco played good for about 90% of that game, good enough to win it. Mm-hmm. And in crunch time, they folded. They folded. And well, you listen, you couldn't get back. Kansas City. You couldn't, get, you couldn't keep Kansas City off the field because all you needed was a first down. You get a yeah. first down, you run out the clock. You San Francisco, you win the Super Bowl championship. They couldn't do it. Yeah, well, I mean, in overtime – you see, look, okay, so let, let's put it this way. In overtime, why did Kyle take the ball first? Right. I was, that was how my next are, question. How are the players talking about now they didn't know the rules in overtime? They didn't know the rules. How is that? Why wouldn't you give it to Patrick first and make them have to score a touchdown? And then you have the choice to then go back and say, hey, look, now not only can we score, do we need to score? Two-point conversion. And the two point we know exactly what we need to do. Right. Why wouldn't you do that? I mean, those, I th- those are the kind of things. I thought the only have. explanation, Lewis, was that they were gassed at the end of regulation because they wanted to feel for so long. The defense, and that, right. And that he thought that there was no way they'd be able to stop them right. because they That's were gassed in overtime. That's the only thing I can think of. That's possible. And I said that in the booth. But for his players to come out and say, look, we never really even discussed this and went over this, wow. we didn't even know. And then you have Chris Jones talking about the fact that we've been repping this since training camp. Right. This perfect scenario. Man, I'm telling you what. There are going to be some sleepless nights out there in Santa Clara for a long time. Because mm-hmm. this was a total meltdown. They should have won that game, man. But you know what? 
shoulda, coulda, woulda, whatever you want to call it. You let Patrick have enough time to figure it out. You let Andy have enough time to figure it out. You let Spags have enough time to figure out what's your pressure point to where I can make you break and not be able to make a play. This is what's going to happen. You're going to lose to these guys. you got Hall of Fame people on this team. Hall of Fame coach, Hall of Fame quarterback. Hall of Fame tight end who made big plays when they needed him to. The result is what it is. So now what do we say about Kyle Shanahan? Three straight NFC titles. Bro, I don't title know. Games, four title games, four NFC title games in the last five years. Two Super Bowl appearances. No Super Bowl championship as a coach. And oh, by the way, when he was the offensive coordinator in Atlanta, they had a 28-3 to lead. Yep. They lost that to Tom Brady and the New England Patriots, in part because they didn't run the football. They, should, yep. they, they, they kept throwing it, which means with an incomplete pass, stopping the clock and giving Brady and New England time to come back on you. Mm -hmm. Then he's the head coach in Kansas, in, in San Francisco. They've got a 10-point lead in the fourth quarter against the San Francisco – I'm sorry, against the Kansas City Chiefs. Yep. They blew that. They yep. have a 10-point lead in this game, yep. and they blow that. What yeah. are we to make of Kyle Shanahan in light of those realities combined yeah. with what you just finished saying about the sleepless nights that are yeah. going to obviously be provoked because of the outcome of this game? Hey, man, what I say is this. Brilliant play caller, play designer. That's a great way of really jiving with his players, pulling out the best of them. But as far as being a game day in the moment tactician, all the things that used to be that people used to beat Andy Reid down for, He's kind of showing some of them cracks now. Mm. And he's going to have to learn from them now. The question is, well, people are going to say, well, how long do you let him continue to have, continue to like learn on the job? Well, I mean, he's gotten his teams to two Super Bowls. He's had 10-point leads in both Super Bowls as head coaches. I mean, you're going to fire him? No, you ain't going to fire him. But he's going to be one of those people who you're going to constantly go, is he good enough to get him over the hump with his, you know, with his strategizing in the, in the moment? We don't know. So far, he's not. Now, I can tell you this. I know he didn't coach uh, Colton McKibbitts, the right tackle, to turn loose Chris Jones on third right. down. And over to, I know he ain't coaching that. Mm -hmm. he, ain't co he, he ain't coached the guy in special teams to get the ball knocked off his, exactly. foot, his back of the foot. Exactly. Or, or McLeod to not just drop on the football exactly. and, and cover it instead of trying to pick it up and run with it. Exactly. He's not coaching that kind of stuff. But you know what? In the end, that stuff all filters up to the head coach, and he's going to be the one who has to answer for it because ultimately he's in charge. And really, that's all, that's all we care about are the end results. If the 49ers had won this game, I had Christian McCaffrey as the MVP. Would I have been wrong as opposed to Brock Purdy? Would I have been wrong? If Brock had thrown a touchdown in overtime and say they win it, say, say, say they somehow were able to get um, Kansas City off the field, he had hit either Ayuk or Jennings there, I think he's going to I think he's gonna get it. Mm -hmm. I think he's going to get it in that moment because the ball was in his hands. He made the decision, and he put it on the right spot. Because he made some money throws now. He mm -hmm. made some money throws. But at the same time, there were some times there, the three straight drives starting in the third quarter where he couldn't get anything going. Spags had him ha and had their pressure packages dialed up. But I think simply because the ball would have been in his hands in the last moments of the game, and it would have been the deciding points, I think he would have got it. Just a couple more questions before I let you get on out of here. Lewis Riddick right here with Stephen A. Smith. I got to ask you this. When I look at Kansas City, and yep. I said this on numerous occasions over the last week, although I picked Kansas City to win, and I'm not surprised at all that Patrick Mahomes is the MVP, mm -hmm. I said to myself it would actually be better for the game of football if San Francisco won. Yeah. Because there's somebody to knock off Kansas City. Mm -hmm. We see, we know they lost to Brady a couple of years ago in Tampa Bay when he had no offensive line. He was running mm -hmm. for his life. He spent Super Bowl running for his life. Mm -hmm. but for the most part, obviously, it's three Super Bowl titles in five years. We know what Patrick Mahomes, Travis Kelsey, and the crew bring to the table. I said, if San Francisco beats them, then you've got somebody in Purdy with Debo, with Christian McCaffrey, with Kyle Shanahan that obviously slayed the dragon. Yeah. If you don't have that, where do you go from here? They're young, Kansas City I'm talking about. They're young, they're physical defensively. They've got athletes. They put a hat on you. Mm -hmm. They're exceptionally well coached by Steve Spagnola. And then mm -hmm. on the offensive side of the ball, they spent the lead, the season leading the league in drop passes. And you still end up winning the Super, the Super Bowl championship without a Tyreek Hill, without yeah. the luxury of a guy that, that, that helped you win the Super Bowl before, or somebody literally like DeAndre Hopkins or somebody else. You don't have those dudes, and you still win the Super Bowl. What hope is there for the National Football League? I know it's parity. I know that it's competitive. Any given Sunday mm -hmm. injuries can happen. But all things being equal in terms of health. 
Yeah. What hope is there that somebody's going to knock off Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey and these boys the way they're looking? Yeah, it's going it's to come down to, look, the thing that will give other teams a lot of hope is if, one, if Andy were to retire or, and or leave in the next two, three years, I'll two something, that. God forbid, I don't even want to say, but somehow 15 ain't on the field. Right. But otherwise, Brett Veach and Andy Reid are like this when it comes to understanding what the team needs, the kind of players that they want and what they can ultimately get out of them. So that that's not going to change for the foreseeable future. What you hope is that, you know, what the, what the hope has to be is in the most crucial moments, it's not about necessarily physical skill against Patrick. It's about not committing the dumb mistakes that allow him time to figure stuff out because you're going to figure it out. You have to beat him more so with smart football than by necessarily being, you know, great athletes, okay? Because, right. look, New England beat him because, guess, I mean, look what happened. New England didn't make mistakes. Like, let's, let's say go, go back to his AFC title game where Tom Brady beat him when Frank Clark jumps off sides, right? Right. You have to hope almost that, you, like, you play smart football and let them make the mistakes. Let them beat themselves. But you can't commit dumb penalties. You can't commit errors like you have in terms of touching the football and punt return team and giving them the ball in plus, you know, in plus yeah. territory. You can't do that. So right. that's your hope. You better get, you better get with it up here even more so than on the field. Cause San Francisco, man for man, one, two, 53, most football people would tell you, you don't have to be a football person. That's a more talented team. They would tell you that they told, they would tell you that Baltimore was a team that they were like, man, this is going to be a war now. Right. We don't know how we're going to come up out of this. But you know what gave them hope? The fact that Andy is there and Pat is there. So as long as you have those two, you're always going to put doubt into the opponent's eyes no matter how good they are. Who do, you, who do you give the best chance to to knock them off in both the AFC and the entire league? Uh, you know what? There's one cat in the entire league who mentally – can compete on par with Patrick and can raise the level of the people around him the same way Patrick can. And who is and that's that? Joe Burrow. Yeah. That's Joe Burrow. That's the only guy for me. The mm. only guy. And he has proven. See, Joe Burrow. Because he beat just him. Like Pat, just like Patrick is in everyone else's head, Joe Burrow was in Kansas City's head. Mm. Okay? That's a fact. He was Since he was driving this team crazy now, and when he comes back, He's really the one guy right now that is there with him. That is there with him. Because he's and unflappable. Since, he, since he's going to be a problem. Since he's going to be a problem. Anybody yep. in the NFC? Because right now, I mean, I looked at San Francisco the way they played defense yesterday, but I said to myself, you know something? Let me look at the rest. I mean, if Detroit ran the ball more in the second half, San Francisco ain't even there. Yeah, that's I'm true. Matthew Stafford. I'm, I'm not willing to tell you that Brock Purdy is better than Matthew Stafford. And right, Puka Nakua... Right. I right. mean, and, and the stud that he's proven to be just as a rookie. I yep. mean, I, I think the, the Rams have a tremendous upside. I'm wondering about teams in the NFC. Anybody in the NFC? Oh, yeah, yeah. Look, look, look. Detroit, Detroit will take another leg up. They will. Detroit's going to be there for a while now. And don't count San Francisco out. Because, mm -hmm. per, look, Purdy came back from an injury that no other quarterback has ever come from as a second-year Mr. Irrelevant guy. Right. You think he's not going to continue to get better? He hasn't plateaued. He's going to get better. Mm -hmm. Sam Fran will continue to be there. John Lynch and them are too good as far as finding players. Detroit is going to be there. And the Rams, look, I was texting with Sean McVay the other day. He was like, man, this is killing me not being in this game. Right. And you know they're going to be exceptionally well coached too. So, yeah, there's there's a couple teams in it in the NFC. There's a couple teams in it in the AFC. But Joe Burrow, it's not like they're in it. They're right there. Mm. They're right there with 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 KC, and they can beat them at any. That's the only team that I feel as though that quarterback is saying, "Hey, yo, for what you do, I can do. For what you do, I can do." And I'll tell you who Kansas City fears. Kansas City fears Buffalo. I was getting ready to bring up Josh. Kansas Hammer City Buffalo. fears Buffalo because they say the people down there will tell you that Josh Allen scares them. Man, they know that they cannot. Like Patrick has to raise it like to another, another level because of what Josh Allen can do. Well, my last question to you is, you didn't say the league MVP, Lamar Jackson. You know what? I think I'm talking about like right now. Okay, so, and you know I love Lamar. Yeah. Okay. I'm wondering, look, 
here, here's the next level for Lamar, right? The next level for Lamar, and he's taking his game up levels every year. Yeah. The next level now is for him and Todd Monken to be on the same page to where they don't have the kind of like brain lapses like they had against Kansas City where they start forgetting who they are. Right. That Lamar start, starts forgetting who he is. Like Todd Monken got to tell him, Lamar, in the middle of this game, Lamar, you got to go. You got to go now. We can't be holding it in the pocket. And he got to tell Todd Monk, hey, look, we got to run the rock here. What are you doing? Why are we Why are we dropping me back, keeping me in the pocket? Because Patrick will tell Andy that. Mm. And Joe Burrow will tell the coaches in Cincinnati that. That's the next level for him. Mm. Because you got to be at that level in order to match what ultimately Kansas City can do, even when it ain't going good for him. Appreciate the time, man. Thank you so much, Lewis Riddick. Always appreciate your greatness, man. Have a great, great off season. I don't think you have an off season though. No, I mean, bro, it's, 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 it's so draft cool. time. It's draft, it's draft time, time, right? Yeah, That's we right. I gotta have you on the draft. One of these days, I'm gonna interrupt you on the draft. Just you know, I'm gonna roll up there. I'm gonna have to make sure I got a collar shirt, but three buttons are gonna be. Lit. You need, you know what? I'm you roll need to up do that out there with my, with my big sexy look. That's what I'm gonna do, man. I'm Come gonna do up it. there in Detroit. Do that. It's gonna be in Detroit this year. It's in Detroit. Wow. Wow. That, see, that's why people wanted them to go ahead and make it to the Super Bowl. That well, city's going to be crazy for the draft. It, it's going to be crazy for the draft, and finally yeah. they're relevant again. I'm happy for that city. I really, really am because Absolutely. I thought Dan Campbell did a hell of a job, and Jared Goff proved himself to be a real yes, quality indeed. football coach, and I love Gibbs and Montgomery running the football. They got some weapons in Detroit. I don't know what the hell happened to them. Hey, Jameer Gibbs, hey, let's just go on the record and say it now. I said it a couple a couple weeks ago, about a month ago. Jameer Gibbs will be a front runner for MVP next year if they give him the rock more. He's the most electric player in the league right now, regardless of position. Right. You see the speed. You see what he can do. Yeah. That kid is for real. He's going to burst onto the scene a la Marshall Falk type stuff yep. next year. Watch. But you got to keep Montgomery there with him to protect him from being right. overloaded. You got to do right. that. See, I right. learned a little something from you, man. I learned a little yeah. something from you. I, see, I, I, didn't know know that, I didn't know that until I started talking to Lewis no, Ray. I didn't know. You, you know, ball. You know how it goes. <laughs> you know how Appreciate how you. Love you, bro. Thank course, you so much for your time, bro. Appreciate of you. Of course. All, All right. right. The one and only Lewis Riddick right here with Stephen A. And the Stephen A. Smith Show. Courtesy of YouTube. Back with more in a minute. Everyone knows I'm a sports fanatic and I need to be in the middle of all the action. And how do I do that exactly? I use Prize Picks, the largest fantasy sports platform in all of the land with more than 3 million members. It's not only super exciting, but incredibly easy to play and takes only 60 seconds to make your picks. All you do is select two or more players from the NFL, the NBA, or even both. And then choose more or less on their in-game stats. So every catch, touchdown, or basket gets bigger every week. And there's no better way to turn the big game's energy into cash. So if you know everything about every player, like I do, and then pick correctly, you'll have a chance to win some big-time money. And get this. Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. That's right. Go to prizepicks.com and use code SAS for a first deposit match of up to $100. That's code SAS when you go to prizepicks.com. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Welcome back to Stephen A. Smith's show right here over the digital airways of YouTube. Thanks again to the one and only Lewis Riddick for coming on the show and breaking down. Uh, the whole uh, Super Bowl 58 festivities and everything like that. I shouldn't say festivities, but the game itself, because it was festive, to be quite honest with you. I know it was boring in some people's eyes for the first couple of quarters, but as far as I'm concerned, it was competitive. And as long as you got a competitive game and the outcome isn't fully decided in advance, that is a thrilling game to me. The only thing, that, the only exception I would make is when New England beat the Rams years ago, like 13 to three or something. I did. I was at the game and was snoring. So I get where you're coming from. Anyway, couple of touch, a couple of things I wanted to touch on before I got to Usher and his performance at halftime, Super Bowl halftime. Let's get into some of these commercials because believe it or not, um, I liked a few of them. All of them weren't that great, but I kind of like it. Needless to say, um, I'm going to talk to you about a few people, the J. Lowe's of the world, the Beyonce's of the world and others. But let me get right to it. The Duncan rap group, Ben Affleck, Matt Damon, Tom Brady on the turntable. Zig -a -zig. Zika, 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 zika. Oh, I, it was hilarious. I like that. And Tom Brady rocking the shades. That was pretty fly. No doubt about that. I like that. And, and Ben Affleck, I didn't know why they tried to give him to dance even a little bit. But J. Lo, you know, being there, obviously that makes up for it. We understand he was trying to impress her. And then, you know, I would say to all of you ladies out there, all of you ladies out there, see, y'all always getting on the dudes. Y'all always getting on the dudes. Well, how about this commercial where, rah, 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 rah. She sat up there and said, you know, y'all got to go. 
you know, this ain't going to work. All right. I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically the message that she gave them. And Ben Affleck and Matt Damon and them are walking out. And Tom Brady's getting released. She said, oh, Tom, you, you can stay. Now, see, if the fellas did that, it would have been a problem. It would have been a problem. But, 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 but she could do that. She's J-Lo, right? She's J-Lo, so she could do that, right? She could sit up there and tell her man, you know, you could leave, but Tom Brady could stay. Now, I like the commercial, but I ain't like that part. I'm just letting y'all know right now, okay? My next up, I'm looking at <clears throat> State Farm. You talk about Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito. Decades after Twins, that's what the name of the movie was, with him, they reunited to promote this uh, the Super Bowl commercial. It was funny because Arnold Schwarzenegger couldn't say neighbor. 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 He couldn't pronounce the word neighbor. He kept saying neighbor, okay? So that was kind of funny. I thought it was great. I thought it was, I thought it was good, shall I say. I've seen greater commercials, but it was good. It was funny. And, of course, you know what? I'm going to put number one. I'm going to put my girl Beyonce number one, okay? First of all, let's understand something here, okay? She was doing a commercial for Verizon, but in the midst of doing all of that, her Renaissance 2 album was coming up, all right? Okay? And, 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 and she dropped a couple of country songs, by the way, country music songs, by the way. She did that. And damn near broke the Verizon internet because that's, you know, coming out, had the lemonade stand, dropping new music, playing the saxophone, becoming a gamer, introducing the AI version of herself, which looked quite sexy, by the way. Yes, an AI figure looking sexy. And of course, channeling the Barbie in her, turning into Barbev. And I also love Botus, Beyonce of the United States. Yes, that was pretty damn fly. Okay. So I like those three commercials. Just want to throw that out there. So let me get that out of the way. That's number one. Number two, having said all of that, um, Taylor Swift was in attendance, and I want to say this. She was in attendance to join the game with a man, Travis Kelsey, all that stuff. That was nice. But Beyonce dropping some music, letting everybody know about the new album coming out, all that other stuff, you know. I don't care how great Taylor Swift is. And she is marvelous. She's fantastic. And Swifties are everywhere. I'm going to say it before, just like I said it again. There's only one Beyonce. There's only one. And you got people looking at her and talking about, she looks light. She looks light. First of all, she got no makeup. Secondly, I've seen her in person as well as on TV. She never looks worse. Ever. Ever. So let's get that out the way. And it was good to see them all at the Super Bowl and stuff like that. That was pretty live. That was pretty fly. Beyonce with the new album dropping country music too. Country music. You got, anytime I think about country music, I only think about one person, Kenny Rogers. You got to know when to hold them. That's just me. That's just me. Okay. So it's going to be interesting to see what Beyonce has to say. Moving on, the halftime show itself. Now, <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let, 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 me, let me explain something about myself. I'm very particular about the halftime shows. Um, Beyonce by herself in 2013 was spectacular. Bruno Mars a couple of years later by himself was spectacular. Prince in 2006, I was there in attendance as a spectator. And I remember it being gray skies but still dry and didn't start raining until the brothers started singing Purple Rain. Now, if that ain't divine intervention, I don't know what is. And so when you look at it from that perspective, you got to put that up there as tops. How can anybody beat Prince when he had divine intervention on his side? Because the Lord said he's singing Purple Rain. So let it rain. And that is what happened. And so I just want to say that I can't put much above that. But I will tell you this. When I think about the great, great Super Bowl shows, I think about Beyonce with Coldplay and Bruno Mars. Of course, I'm thinking about Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg, Mary J. Blige, Kendrick Lamar, Eminem, 50 Cent, and the crew. Okay. But Usher was not bad. First of all, the brother could dance. The brother could dance, the brother could sing, 
Thirdly, and just and almost as important, I like the cast that he had. Alicia Keys, we keep forgetting. We see, we think about her singing, her voice. We keep forgetting how beautiful that woman is. Swiss Beats is a lucky man. That red dress, let's just say she wore it really, really, really well. Okay? Now, I don't know how Swiss Beats felt about, you know, Usher getting behind her and hugging her like that, you know? I mean, I don't know how he felt about that. My man Kendrick Perkins had a picture on Twitter, had his shades clocked down, like looking at him. He said, this is Swiss Beats looking at Usher touching my wife. I mean, I get it. I get it. But we forgot how beautiful Alicia Keys is. Okay? Beautiful woman. What a nice figure. I just thought I'd throw that in there. Her was up there. Okay? Lil John was up there. Yes! Okay! Yeah, I saw him. Okay? And of course, Luda, my brother from another mother. We got to get together and inspect our family tree because we look so much alike, at least before my hairline receded about three feet. But that's what it is, okay? So I love the performance. I thought Usher did a great job. I thought he did a great job including all the folks with him too. So I had to give a lot of love to all of that. Jermaine Dupri was up there, Lil John, Ludacris, like I said. The HBCU, Sonic Boom, Jackson State, Sonic Boom of the South. That's what they call themselves. Got to give HBCU marching band some love. They showed up there. They were there as well. And let's remember that when we're talking about Usher, we're talking about an eight-time Grammy Award winner. Remember that. It's normally 13 minutes. He negotiated a 15-minute slot. Give him love and credit where it's due. I'm not going to say it was the best show, all right? But it was a pretty damn good show. It was nothing boring about it. He turned it down. I like how they came out there with the roller skates as well. And his dance team ain't no joke. I really enjoyed it. Overall, I got to give the halftime show and the Super Bowl festivities a B plus. I got to give it a B plus, okay? I can't put it before Prince. I can't put it before Dr. Dre and Snoop and the crew. I can't put it before Beyonce, Bruno Mars, Coldplay. But it was up there. It was up there. That's my take on it. I hope you can appreciate that. Up next, originally I was going to touch on the president because he certainly has his way of offending some folks. But evidently he's not alone. Megyn Kelly, ever heard of her? Along with a few other people. They had, they had something to say about the black national anthem. Okay. Well, I got something to say about them. Stick around. You're watching the Stephen A. Smith Show right here over the digital airways of YouTube. Back in a second. Welcome back to Stephen A. Smith Show over the digital airways of YouTube. Before I get on out of here for the day, um, I'll make sure on the back end of this, uh, this commentary that I'm about to give, I'll get to your tweets. Um, and I'll make sure I'll address some of your questions via Twitter and we'll go from there. But for the moment, I felt the need to tackle a particular subject that raised some angst, to say the least, uh, particularly in conservative circles. Um, Andre Day and her fabulous self sang what is widely recognized as the uh, Black National Anthem during Super Bowl Sunday, lift every voice and sing. Um, for those of you who don't know too much about that song, I mean, I've been singing it since I was in grade school. Um, unlike Trump and others, I know it by heart. Um, and one of the reasons you sang it because uh, it was a song that became an anthem, an anthem during the darkest years of the civil rights movement. I'm sure y'all heard about the civil rights movement, right? You know, when black people all over were fighting for civil rights and equality in this country, where people were being hosed down, had dogs sicked on them, were being beaten with batons and were thrown and incarcerated, um, in some cases murdered, maimed, etc. 
simply because we were human beings that thought that we should have the rights and equal rights of every citizen in the United States of America. You remember that? Remember what that movement was about? That's in its darkest hours was when it became the national anthem for black people. Well, lo and behold, it was saying at the Super Bowl last night in Las Vegas, Nevada by the great Andre Day. And there were numerous people who took umbrage with that. Um, putting on my glasses again, because I want to make sure I read stuff accurately. Um, Carrie Lake, remember her? The Trump-backed Republican out of Arizona. Y'all remember who she is? Um, she declined to stand for the quote-unquote black national anthem. Colorado's uh, GOP rep Lauren Bobart, Bobert tweeted her objections, stating, quote, America only has one national anthem. Why is the NFL trying to divide us by playing multiple? Do football, not wokeness. Okay. But of course, then there was Megyn Kelly. Megyn Kelly is a very popular podcaster um, who used to work at Fox News. She's a former Fox News host. Um, I've had the pleasure of meeting her on several occasions. Um, she said, quote, tweeted, quote, the Black National Anthem does not belong at the Super Bowl. We already have a national anthem, and it includes everyone. That's what she said. And, of course, she has her supporters because there were plenty of people who spoke up on her behalf. And, obviously, Kerry Lake was one of them. Bobert was another, along with several others, because they felt that the Black National Anthem was, quote, a manufactured push for segregation. You see, before I say anything else, let me first say, I'm sick and tired of folks out there, particularly in the black community, being so quick to throw out the word racism. When you throw out the word racism, do me a favor. Have more evidence before you do it so it can't be dismissed via plausible deniability or something else. I don't know Megyn Kelly at all. Okay? I don't find her statement to be racist. I find it to be, in her eyes, patriotic. I find it to be, in her eyes, self-righteous. I find her to be a bit detached from reality being faced by black Americans everywhere. I got that part. But I can't go in the way that I wanted to go in about her when people are out there from my community just throwing out the word racist. You don't know that about her. You don't know that about her. And when you say something like that, you dilute the potency and the importance of the argument. I'm going to say something that's very unpopular, but it's factually needs to be addressed. I don't expect white people to have the sensibilities of black people. I don't expect somebody white to get it about black people the way I expect black people to get it about black people. I may not like it. Megyn Kelly, if you're watching, you're listening, I don't like what you said at all. I think it comes across as highly insensitive. You cannot take into account history. You cannot acknowledge because you are a historian. I've heard you. I've watched you. I've listened to you. Profound respect for you. I've even listened to your interview, your lengthy interview with my former colleague at ESPN, Sage Steele, who a lot of people don't like, but I respect and I like because I've known Sage Steele for nearly 30 years. It doesn't mean I agree with everything she says. I certainly don't agree with all of her politics, but. I've known her for years and I respect her. What I'm saying to you, however, Megyn Kelly, I'm only bringing up her name to let you know I've listened to you on many occasions. We run across each other during my visit at Fox News in the past. And respect is obviously something you should require because your body of work is that significant. I get it. But you ain't black. 
You haven't been marginalized and ostracized and treated in the manner that black people have been treated. Now, as a woman, you have certainly had your challenges. Last time I checked, the person who gave you the most grief about being a woman was the former president of the United States, who's the front runner for the GOP nomination. He's the one that was very disrespectful to you, very dismissive, brought up stuff that I'm not about to repeat. Over these waves, these digital airwaves, I'm not going to do that, but you know it. He was very insulting, very demeaning, marginalizing, all of this stuff, very degrading. That was a GOP candidate. I love how all of these GOP folks jump to one another's defense, but you're going to negate who was the most insulting to you. But I digress. My point is, is as a woman... I am certainly not qualified to speak to your plight and your challenges and the manner of things that you've had to overcome. Although you are a white woman and everybody knows when you talk about stuff like affirmative action, the bene biggest beneficiaries of affirmative action have been white women. Not that that qualifies with you. I'm just saying I'm using that point to highlight no matter what it is that you've been through. I'm willing to bet it's nothing compared to what black people have gone through. So all I'm saying is, if you ain't black, you may not understand. And if you don't understand, why not be neutral? If you don't understand, why not listen to the black national anthem? And then listen to the national anthem. Why not just do that and call it a day? Why do we have to get our antennas up and, and, and get agitated and all of this other stuff because we're hearing something that we're not accustomed to hearing and we didn't want to hear. Why do that? Why, Megan Kelly? Why? You are not black. You haven't been profiled like black people have. You haven't been demeaned and denigrated to the degree that black people have been. You haven't been enslaved like black people were. You haven't had your rights denied to you as black people have. Historically, you know this. So why not just sit up there and say, hey, I understand where they're coming from. Why not? We talk about all of us coming together. You know why we can't come together? Because the first order of business in order to come together is for somebody to know that you understand where they're coming from. Where they're coming from. Last time I checked, Megan Kelly was married. I don't know what her status is now. I hope you're happily married and all of that other stuff with you and your family. Nothing but the greatest. God bless you all. But hypothetically speaking, no knowledge of your relationships or anything like that. If you are with someone and you decide that, hey, you know what? How is this going to work? People talk about compromise. They talk about communication. You know what comes along with compromising and communication? Understanding. Even if we disagree, I understand exactly where you're coming from. You understand where I'm coming from. We've reached an accord or we've agreed to disagree and we move forward. As opposed to summarily dismissing a point you can't possibly comprehend. Would you rather us play all the verses of America's national anthem to give details syllable by syllable of what was uttered and echoed in the complete song as opposed to the iteration we all sing before games? Do you want us to get into that to crystallize for you why we felt the need to have our own national anthem? You want to go there? You sure? I don't think you would. So the representative Bo Bart and Carrie Lake. And to you too, Megan Kelly, again, who I have profound respect for in terms of your body of work. I don't know you. I just know what you've been as a journalist and I respect the hell out of you. I respectfully say to you, could you do one or two things? Could you have a more thorough understanding of black history? What provoked the existence of the black national anthem? 
and speak to that reality or simply stomach it. Because let me tell you something about black people all over this world. The one thing you cannot accuse us of as a people in America or anywhere in this stratosphere. You can't accuse of us of an inability to stomach stuff. We've stomached a lot. Can't y'all? It's time for me to get to our tweets before I get on out of here for today. You're listening and watching the Stephen A. Smith show right here over the digital airwaves of YouTube. Let's go to the tweets. Today's fan tweets are brought to you by our newest sponsor, SeatGeek. Whenever I'm looking to find the best deal on tickets to sporting events or that Taylor Swift concert I spent the fortune on, the best place I've found to do it is on the SeatGeek app. SeatGeek gives you access to over 70,000 events, including concerts, sport events, festivals, and more. That's why I'm excited to have a ticketing partner that helps the Stephen A. Smith Show listeners navigate today's ticketing market. SeatGeek provides you access and convenience on tickets to almost any event you're looking for. That even includes all the big-time games, as well as top artists like Drake, Jelly Roll, Beyonce, and more. That's right, I said Jelly Roll, y'all. Y'all didn't know I knew about that, did y'all? They put all the tickets across the web in one place to make sure you're getting the best deal. So go and download the SeatGeek app and use my code SAS for $20 off tickets at SeatGeek. That's right, you heard me. $20 off your first purchase with promo code SAS. Make sure you click the link in the description to download the app now. Let's read some of these tweets, please. Let's get right to it, please. I need my glasses, you know what I'm saying? I need my glasses right there. Ain't got nothing to do with age. I see plenty of people younger than me that need glasses. My eyes have been better than them for decades, but I digress. Let's get right to it here, okay? A bunch of tweets that I'm interested in seeing right now. Let's go to this one. At Saga Suplex writes, If you could have dinner with any historical figure, but they had to order from a fast food menu, who would it be, and what do you think they'd order? <sighs> interesting, interesting, interesting. You know what I'm going to say? I'm going to say Barack and Michelle Obama. I'm going to get them both. I know it's supposed to be one, but damn it, they married. They are one, ain't they? They won. They're a union, are they not? I would say Barack and Michelle Obama. And I'm going to say... A nice, juicy, thick filet mignon. That's what I want, fresh off the grill. That's what I want. Barack and Michelle Obama. And if I had to choose between one or the other, of course it would be Barack, but I want them both. I want them both. That would be the answer to my question. That's just my personal opinion. I'm going to throw that out there. Next writes, oh Lord, this is from Nick's Muse. He writes, who will go down with a better legacy? Kevin Knox. Or Frank Neela Kina. Oh my goodness. I don't even know how to answer that question. That's almost like asking me, do I want somebody f ugly? Okay. Or do I want somebody with no figure? Both are an atrocity to me. I And just as an aside, y'all, speaking of that, that last part, I'm not averse to anything. I mean, I'm not Pooley who loves his big women like Rasputia from the movies Norbit. That's his style. Nor am I some of these dudes who like folks who are so skinny as females, they look anorexic. I like voluptuousness. I like a, a figure. I mean, that's just my flavor because my attitude is... Why would I be with a woman where I have a buttocks or breasts that are bigger than hers? That's just me. I understand some people don't care. But I do. So that's how I feel about it. So when you ask me a question about Kevin Knox or Frank Nielakina, all I can think about is Frank Nielakina because that's when I wanted Phil Jackson banned from New York State. I thought he shouldn't have been allowed in the state. 
Um, he was clearly asleep at the wheel. And Phil Jackson drafted Frank Nilakina instead of Donovan Mitchell. I'm still appalled. I'm still appalled. So that's the answer that I'm going to go with, even though Kevin Knox hasn't been anything to brag about. This next one is a very, very interesting question. And this is from at updating on Rome. Hey, Stephen A., who, where would you rank Julius Caesar in the all-time great generals? So naturally, you know, I had to do my homework. I had to look it up. I had to look at some of the great generals of all time. I had to look at Caesar, known for his tactical and strategic acumen and talent for warfare was legendary. Of course, Alexander the Great, he was a great general, but didn't have many battles. He died at the age of 32, so I'm definitely not picking him. Ulysses S. Grant won the Civil War in the presidency. I guess that's something to consider. Napoleon, considered by most to be the GOAT general. Hmm. I'm still going to roll with Caesar. I'm still going to roll with Caesar. Okay. Tactical, strategic, and talent for warfare was legendary. I would have to go with Caesar as number one. That's where I'm at with it, y'all. Last but not least, I got a graphic that I want to put up for y'all because listen to this from a Mikey Coin Snatch. He writes, Stephen A., your budget is $15. Win me the championship this year. Okay, so he's got $5 down to four, three, two, one. This is how he got it categorized. Luka Doncic at 5 Tyrese Halliburton at $4. Damian Lillard is $3. Uh, Trey Young at $2. Jalen Brunson at $1. They got here this other graphic. I'm just looking for the graphic here, okay? Uh, when you look at it, what is it saying here? Shooting guards. $5, Shea Gilgis Alexander. 4, Donovan Mitchell. 3, Devin Booker. 2, Kyrie Irving. 1, Tyrese Maxey. Small forwards. Giannis, LeBron, Kawhi, Paul George, down to Laura Markkinen. Lori Markkinen at the small forward spot, at the power forward spot. These people don't know what they're talking about. They got Joel Embiid at the power, as a power forward. That is not true. Jason Tatum, Kevin Durant, okay, Pascal Siakam, and Julius Randle from $5 to $1. And last but not least, Nikola Jokic, Anthony Davis, DeMontis Sabonis, Chris Stapps Porzingis, and this kid Chet Holmgren. All right, are y'all ready for this? First of all, I'm taking Jalen Brunson for $1 all day, every day. We're going to do that. So now I'm down to $14, okay? I'm taking Jokic because Embiid keeps getting hurt. So I'm going to go with Jokic at the $5 spot. So that's $6, okay? I got $9 to go. I'm going to take Jason Tatum. That's at $4. So that knocks it down to $5 with two spots to go. Okay, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to go with, hmm, Paul George at two and Kevin Durant at three. That's it for this segment of the Stephen A. Smith Show. I'll holler at y'all later. Peace and love, everybody.